हाँ भाई क्या हाल है तो आज ये पॉडकास्ट हम दो चैनल पे कर रहे हैं वी आर स्ट्रीमिंग दिस लाइव ऑन अभिजीत चैनल एंड ऑन द चारवक पॉडकास्ट सो बिफोर एवरीबडी गेट्स इन टू द जिस्ट ऑफ द डिस्कशन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल अभिजीत थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर कमिंग एंड फॉर एग्रीइंग टू डू दिस विद मी Thank you for having me. It's been a long time since we had a podcast together. Since you hosted me on on the on, yeah, on your podcast, but it's yeah. great to be back. Last, कभी बात की थी पांच छह साल पहले when I had just started podcasting. When you were doing audio podcast. Yes. Yeah. You know, we I think we did a audio only, and I think once we did a video podcast. Pan- the audio, तो याद है. I'm not sure about the video thing. I'm sure you'll be able to find them. Yeah, I think it there. was an audio podcast, and hmm. uh, so. to give everyone a brief background how did abhijit and i get get talking huh. so i was obsessed with aryan invasion yeah, yeah, migration yeah. and we have a common obsession <laughs> <laughs> so both of us had this obsession with aryan migration and aryan uh, invasion yeah. and i was like yaar ye banda hai na ye mere jaise papers padhta hai so i remember talking to you and i was like yaar tune ye paper padha hai and then you were like tune ye paper padha hai and then i was like are yaar iske upar charcha karte hain hmm. and and tabhi genetics ka bada shagufa tha yeah, are because... genes have answered we have all answered the question and then i remember reaching um, out to you and you know you agreed to come and then hmm. obviously after that uh, you started uh, your own youtube uh, thingy and I mean, first of all, congratulations! Your success story makes me feel so happy and so proud. Uh, Thank and, you so and much. Pe- people, you know, people don't understand. A lot of times, people think YouTubers are confrontational or anything. Why would That's, they? Why would I mean, they be? <laughs> it's not like media, man. We're not like that. And <laughs> for me to see your success um, is so nice. It is so amazing that uh, I have never really, you know, felt. Uh, perturbed or uh, like, like i i am so glad to see you contribute because a you know maybe let's assume people are watching you for the first time let's start here tell mm-hmm. everybody about your own journey wahan se chalu karte hain my journey i mean it's it's a very long convoluted journey but if you talk about if you want to talk about youtube i i put out a video just for fun on youtube it was a video a historical analysis video about chingis khan and it just blew up i mean i i edited the whole thing myself i did not even know how to edit i did the whole thing i put it up on youtube and it just blew up so that's how it started then uh, I, even after that blew up it reached a million views in god knows uh, just a few days but even after that i did not do anything on youtube for about 6 months or 7 months but eventually i just thought of creating some kind of uh, A recurring show on YouTube, so I started doing these live streams. Ask Abhijit. I mean, the viewers will know that. My viewers will know that. Know that at least. So it's a Q and A show, and that uh, took the channel off. Essentially, that's mm. how it took off, and that's that's how the journey started. So you know, you and I are unique in the sense that we are the old dinosaurs who still do live streams, right? Because <laughs> YouTube tells you premiere karo, premiere karo, ah, premiere karo. I yeah. mean, eh, as content creators, we both have been told in the partner program that. why don't you try premieres mm-hmm. right it's been told to us but so why do you still do live streams like me i enjoy live streams you love it right yeah. it's it's the thrill right on it's the thrill. spot questions yeah, on the you spot Wait. you are put on the spot it's more challenging right it's fun i mean yeah it's a challenge but it's fun and if you don't know something you just say i don't know right I mean, what's the big deal i mean there's no tension there's no pressure there if mm-hmm. i don't know something i don't know it i've said so many times on the on the live stream i don't know this so I have no pressure in, while doing a live stream, and I can just be myself. There's no, uh, there's no pressure that you have to speak in a certain way because the camera is recording, and we can do a double, a second take, third take, or whatever. Mm. Just, just do it. Just go with the flow. It's fun that way. I just, so, I just love so it. So, not that you know we don't enjoy in-person podcasts, but personally, which one do you find more challenging, the stream or recording with a camera setup and everything? I think whatever you do less is more challenging. I have done so many streams that's just second nature for me. I can just it's like fish in water. Mm. Uh recording is a little bit it's something I've not done as often as streaming. So I think that's a little more challenging for me. But I'm sure once you if you start doing it regularly it's it that also becomes second nature I guess. Yeah, uh, it's for me um I love streaming because mm. there is pressure. Pressure. Okay. I like pressure. Uh-huh. I like the concept of not having a second take. Mm-hmm. Like the whole concept where this is it, up to bowl. Uh-huh. 
तेरे पास कोई सेकंड टेक नहीं है यू कैन नॉट एडिट दिस शिट आउट नो यू कैंट दैट्स इट जो बोल दिया वो बोल दिया इट्स देयर ऑन द इंटरनेट एंड इवन इफ यू डिलीट इट एंड एडिट इट कोई ना कोई किधर ना किधर से उसको निकाल के तुमको तो फाइंड करेगा आई नो सो आई दैट दैट प्रेशर समहाउ मेक्स मी want to do it even more <laughs> you are thrill seeker are you yes I mean, <laughs> this is my bungee jump <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so i i just find it so challenging at times i'm mm. like if i do serious live streams mm. like you know the standard model is you buy a teleprompter you write your script oh, you yeah. make your video uh-huh. you add graphics and you put it there yeah i'm like usme maza nahi aata usme koi challenge nahi hai yeah yeah so koi challenge nahi i mean you can do uh, 70 takes if you want yeah. if you need to right so yeah. there's no Yeah, and in, in if you're doing a live stream, which is what exactly you and I do, where sometimes you know you have to pull references out yeah, immediately. Yeah, yeah. Immediate references, निकालने पड़ते हैं to back your point up. Mm. That needs such a sharp memory mm. that you're always like, if let's say you're discussing, in your case, you know you do a lot of geopolitics. So if you're talking about let's say Russia, Ukraine, mm. you have to know. everything about russia and ukraine and you have to memorize everything and then if somebody asks you a question and you give an answer they're like praman do and they're like boom on the screen screen share here you go and that's that's the whole point which i enjoy yeah i i typically do the praman giving with a map so i keep the map handy and whatever i'm discussing or whatever is being yeah, asked I, i pull the map out and, and then i show the features and i mean that gives a lot of re- relevance i mean geopolitics is about the intersection of yeah. uh, geography and uh, politics so yeah yeah the map uh, comes in really handy and sometimes i even try and pull out references if if, if they i mean i remember them but that is a kind of a little little more difficult because it's hard to do a google search or whatever search and pull things out but yeah i keep the map handy at least yeah so what i do is when i'm doing a monologue is i'll have this uh, google up uh uh-huh. and it's just single hand i've learned the art of searching from a single hand and typing <laughs> from a single hand like i'm looking here i just search and then i pull it up and i pop it up because mm. you, you remember the book reference or the mm. article that you had read mm. so you just have to type in times of india so and so article blah mm. blah blah because i'm doing politics right mm-hmm. so i have to look at mainstream references mm. and then i pull it up and i show them ha dekh ye kiya tha ha dekh ye kiya tha okay so sometimes people think i have all references ready i don't i actually remember them and i just pull it up <laughs> so that so that's that's what is challenging but obviously today's topic there is a reason why i reached out to abhijit in fact uh, abhijit and i were together in the bangalore lit fest and mm. that's when i you know kind of presented this idea to abhijit because a uh, lot of things have changed since 2000 right mm. pehle there was only dd and before that there were some slots for ndtv or something mm. post 2000 the indian content landscape has changed yeah. first it started with mainstream media a lot of channels coming in i don't even know how many channels exist in india now i think there are two thousands i'm sure i mean i don't know how many exist television channels mm. exist how many newspapers exist i don't even want to um want to get into that but it's a lot yeah it's a lot and then post 2006 7 you have the advent of social media with facebook i Twitter. think it started with orkut yes orkut There was something called orkut back orkut, in the day orkut yeah. yeah or myspace orkut, oh, MySpace. and and on mm-hmm. all those things and then we get into the space but especially for a lot of us it's twitter that changed things yeah. i think for a lot of us i think twitter is a very like it or not it's a very relevant platform if you are into the commentary phase yeah, yeah if you are in the commentary tariat mm. and then a lot of things have gone down and so for those who the reason i uh, approached abhijit is he obviously has a very successful channel and i wanted to discuss the state of our discourse mm-hmm. yeah i remember in 2010 india tv or 2012 india tv kya aliens aapki gaay chura rahe hain mujhe bhi aata i remember that and i was like acha ye bhi aata hai tv pe <laughs> and then today there is a version of that happening on youtube hmm. so credit to abhijit when i you know approached him and i was like yaar abhijit iske upar baat kare he was like i'm more than happy because he was like actually even i have a lot of views about this so if i was to ask you where do we place our discourse i am not concerned about western discourse we are indians we are talking about india primarily mm-hmm. even when we talk about the west we look at it from an indian prism right, right. when you talk about geopolitics you don't give a ukrainian perspective Absolutely you give an not. indian's perspective about russia ukraine mm-hmm. so where would you so where do you place indian discourse overall today from your perspective 
uh well if you were to talk about geopolitics there's a lot of naivete in geopolitics okay the every look what's happened is that the social media has democratized uh expression mm. and everybody i mean there's nothing wrong with it but everybody is now a content creator the yeah. podcasting has become like a cottage industry mm. and everybody has views about everything mm. and uh, i'm not sure how they come up with these views but uh, a lot of the views make no sense okay and uh, yeah there's no logic behind it i mean if you're talking about geopolitics this nation versus that nation how do you de- how do you decide that my opinion is that this nation is going to win or uh, this is whatever is happening so i don't see any logic behind that okay there, there are very few people at least in the indian landscape that i actually even feel like watching i actually don't watch anyone you know um so, so when was the last time if you don't mind me asking you watched any mainstream media news channel news channel i must be a Two three years, I guess. Wow! Yeah, I don't watch watching news for seven years now. Seven years now. I mean, you're ahead of me then. <laughs> I, must be two three years for me. I mean, I can't even remember the last time I watched uh, news, Indian news, or any news. So you don't even watch Indian content for geopolitics? I'm not aware of. I mean, I know that there are lots of YouTubers who talk about geopolitics. I But don't no mainstream think tank content, nothing. Uh, no. I do my own research, my own way. So, how, so okay. So how do you go about it? If you don't mind me asking, how do you go about researching? well i look i listen to the chatter the chatter is in various places it's on social media it's in various publications i typically look at what the Ameri- like, like the top 5 top 6 american publications have to say about a certain topic then i look at what the french have to say i look at what the chinese have to say about it i i try and find out what the russians are saying about this and then you get a kind of a perspective and then you know each of these uh, you know people each of these uh, sides has a certain agenda and a certain prism through which they see things and that kind of helps me clarify what's what's actually happening so if, the truth is always somewhere in between and you have to use your own understanding and logic i mean if you understand the history of the issue if you understand geography you understand who's in power and what their agendas are and where, what what each nation wants then you can kind of deduce for yourself through logic <laughs> uh, what actually could be happening so that's how i do it i don't watch any news channel i don't watch any geopolitical podcasters or commentators uh, i typically find uh, look i'll not take anyone's names but i typically find that most of these views are very shallow and naive i mean saying that xi jinping okay uh, saying that xi jinping is mad i mean what kind of <laughs> what kind of an opinion is that why is he mad what's he done? What, what has he done that makes him mad but yeah you get this sort of thing in india so yeah it's kind of frustrating i really wish that you had some quality you know mm. yeah so that that's how it is and and what i see is that uh, <laughs> it's typically the sensationalist views that get uh, sensationalist opinions mm. that get tremendous amounts of views i have nothing against that you know but it it's kind of uh, so sad but then tell me how do we how do we decipher uh, the truth mm-hmm. that that's the one thing that bothers me the most mm-hmm. when it comes to discourse and mm-hmm. and the overall landscape like if i was to say you know a lot of people are watching this mm. so if i was to ask you ki yaar how does one start researching for a topic even mm. if i was to how do i go about it uh for so if you want to start researching ab initio from from the beginning it's going to take you time it's going to take you i would say weeks months years you know look i don't talk about topics that i have no understanding of okay i only talk about things that i have spent a significant amount of amount of time studying and researching so that's why i understand the patterns once you you're a reader you're a voracious reader you read enough you're going to start seeing patterns you're going to mm. see start seeing patterns that others can't see so if you study a lot of history you start seeing cyclical patterns in history you can start connecting the dots you can see you can start understanding what what causes what it's cause mm. and effect the causal causal chain becomes apparent if you study a lot and study it critically so if you have done a lot of that then you can see what's actually happening you can because you know at the below the surface every nation has certain agendas and you can actually tell which nation has what agendas depending on the geography and their population and overall the whatever the power projection and all that is the threat perception so it's just logic actually for me it's just logic i see, i see everything from the perspective of logic and the perspective of numbers and the perspective of psychology leader psycho- psychology uh, national psychology there is something called the psychology of the masses right every nation also has a certain world view as an amorphous india you know a, a more amorphous aglo- agglomerate so if, if, once you st- once you spend a certain amount of time studying a nation or in an overall in the world then you can make this out so if you want to start from the beginning it's going to take you time and you're going to 
if you for example if you want me to start uh, studying indian politics instead mm. of ge- global geopolitics uh, i think it will take me time to 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 get a sense of what's happening i mean there's so many equations over here uh, electoral equations uh, caste equations apparently and each state has its own thing so th- that would take me a lot of time to get into and i'm not sure even i, I would even be interested in yeah you never comment on politics but how yeah. come how did you stay away from it like it na kabhi temptation nahi hui ki main bhi bol du nahi 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 mujhe politics mujhe i mean i of course get politics it's all about the pursuit of power and uh, expansion expanding your power and your mm. base and all that your networks but i like to see it at the largest scale which is the geopolitical global scale uh politics at the lower levels is kind of petty i mean politics is always petty but it's so it's yeah. it's never really interested me at the at the national and sub national levels i've always been a student of history and that kind of uh, is what drew me into geopolitics because history and geopolitics go hand in hand yeah but but then you know i i mean i i don't follow geopolitics per se uh-huh. i i don't have a mm-hmm. lot of opinion on when I mean, i've had druva on the podcast i've has asked his opinion i've had abhijit ayer mm. or i'll i'll talk to people on and off about uh, geopolitics but i don't have like but the only opinion i have when it comes to geopolitics and foreign policy it's all transactionalism Hmm. everything is transactional from hmm. what i have understood hmm. every time i read or listen to people or try to understand is i mean you know this this entire mythology like let's talk about this mythology i, I yeah. use the word mythology with a lot of responsibility uh-huh. this myth of the global liberal values based uh, <laughs> let's talk about this like what is your opinion on this the only global system is the is a, is a system of power that's the only thing that matters the only thing that is relevant in geopolitics is power okay but you when you are grabbing half the world and you are you know bullying people arm twisting people and and uh, coercing them into doing things that they would otherwise not do when you have to couch it in uh, various layers of of uh, of uh, legitimacy mm. and uh, moral superiority mm. so then you talk about liberal values and human rights and freedom and democracy when you're doing exactly the opposite so this entire global system the so called rules based world order and the liberal democratic order and all that that's just a sham okay i'll tell you that <laughs> because see when it comes to democracy i mean we are a democracy right but in every democratic nation mm-hmm. you will find that there will be extra extra electoral power centers and power networks you know so in a democracy theoretically you you it's it's a representation right you vote for people that person comes to office and they rule the country uh, mm-hmm. on your behalf and it, this is a thing that's periodically renewed so that is typical i mean theoretically where the power should lie in your elected representatives but in every democratic nation you will find that there are networks of power and centers of power that are outside the electoral system mm. you'll find that so that and that takes away the sovereignty of the vote to a certain extent so your vote if it had a value of 1 now it has a value of 0.7 perhaps or 0.6 it kind of uh, erodes and degrades the quality of democracy so it's not so no democracy is actually fully democratic that's the first thing and secondly when it comes to when it when you come to when you talk about global organizations international organizations like the un who all of these are theoretically democratic where every every nation large or small has the same voice and the same vote but if you look at the way the power dynamics go on you will find that the most powerful nation in any block any any multi multinational block is going to be the one that sets the agenda and and uh, whatever happens within it actually furthers their interests and the interests of the smaller or weaker nations typically are you know sidelined so you always find when you look uh, deep inside and and you take time to do that mm. that wherever you have this theoretical democracy actually it's it's used that is entirely used to full, fulfill certain purposes so at the end of the day geopolitics and international relations all of that is just about power in some cases you have more enduring relationships in in the case where you have two nations or three nations or whatever number of nations whose um, interests align over the long term so if you have this kind of convergence of interest then you're going to have a long term cooperation between, between the two nations of course that waxes and wanes but overall 
you see that with certain relationships other relationships are more or less like you said transactional especially when it comes to the largest powers for them everything is transactional because they just want to get their thing done uh, so you see this all the time so in my opinion and i i've seen this all the time that in my opinion uh, the only thing that is re relevant is power how much power does a nation have and power takes lots of forms it's hard power soft power sharp power all that is it's it's it, it augments your hard power but it is it doesn't exist without hard power so what is really relevant is a hard power your real might which is the military might economic might power projection and so on and so forth so do you think soft power is downstream from hard power oh absolutely so i mean indians are so obsessed with soft power indians bollywood. are so obsessed with bollywood is not indian soft power man bollywood is uh that's what I hear all the time. People uh -huh. talking about Bollywood and soft power. No, look, Bollywood it would be soft power if it were to, you know, if it were to uh, portray our values and mm. our culture. Often <clears throat> it does not. I mean, uh, sometimes you hear music and whatever that actually would belong in the Middle East or some other country. Mm. It's not Indian music. So it doesn't really embody Indian culture fully, maybe not even half. So how does that, serve, you know, bolster our soft power? And you know, soft power, like I said, doesn't have any value without hard power. Let's say you are a ra raggedy, poor nation, but you have the greatest culture in the world. But no one's going to respect you because you don't have money. You don't have power. Mm. That's how it goes. I mean, you know, that's what you see in society as well. People may have the greatest of talents. They may be wonderful people. But if they are poor, then nobody values them. The same happens in these international mm. order of nations. Mm. So what really matters is your hard power, your economic power, and your military power, and whatever else comes with that. That's just how it goes. If you have nukes, great. That uh, adds to your power. If you have power projection beyond your territory, yeah, that adds to your power. All that matters, and all that, you know, is all. It all fits into this uh, this this uh, a mystical thing called power. Power does it have a definition? I think you can define power and quantify power if you know how to do it yeah so then okay let me uh, ask a follow-up to this so like you said there are different kinds of relationships hmm. some are more serious hmm. so let's say in america australia or the nato <laughs> those are more serious relationships much more aligned in many ways compared to america and saudi arabia that is just pure transactional because i mean those two societies could not be more different from hmm. each other hmm. or America and Pakistan, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, uh, I don't think so. America would have Pakistani values for American citizens, right? I'll tell you what. America and Pakistan is a very interesting relationship, actually. So Pakistan, as we know, is a nation that's ruled by a military. Yeah. Uh, it has a, 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 you know, a nominal democracy. They hold elections from. As of today, Imran Khan has been sentenced to ten years and then fourteen years of prison. Good, but I Good God, Gabrana Nia. So yeah, so they have elections and all that, which is just, just a sham and an IOSH. We all know who runs the nation. It's the, it is the 10, 15 per rich people and the army, the journals and the ISI. They rule the nation. But this is a nation that is failing. So this, uh, this uh, entire system that they have, it's not really working fine. The US also has a similar system, actually. So the US is a democracy, right? They have two parties. A real democracy would have. I mean, where's the where's the party that? It's more like a republic, less like a democracy. It's if if you want to get very technical, they're a republic. Yeah, they're a republic, but they have two parties. I mean, that's just one step above a one party system, actually, the U.S. And you know, both parties have the same foreign policy. One will bomb you with black planes. One will bomb you with rainbow colored planes. But they'll both both bomb you. Yeah, yeah. They you have know? absolute agreement on that. Yeah. So th that nation is essentially run as an oligarchy. They have oligarchs and they have the military industrial complex and they have really powerful people and you know. You can vote whoever you want to power, but it really doesn't make any difference at the end of the day. That's mm. the way the US is. So it's like a successful version of Pakistan. That's how I see it. So, it, it, you know, from that perspective, and you will see that the Americans always like to do business with despots, you know, autocrats. They find it very hard to do business with actual democracies. They always prefer a dictator as opposed to a person who has been elected democratic. Because you can get things done faster, you can right? get things done faster. And you can understand how a despot's mind, mind works. And in the case of a democratically elected person, they have all kinds of calculations and considerations. They have to appease the public. Then they have to appease the electorate. And they have to re get re-elected. So the Americans prefer dictators to work with. I mean, that, that's what you see all the time. I mean, I've seen that from, if you study the history of since from the 1950s and 60s onwards. They have always made it a point to install their own, you know, uh, favorite dictators in place, especially in places like Africa and all. So America is in a strange, 
you know way it's it's like a successful version of pakistan so i mean america and now their latest interest in bangladesh is also quite interesting oh yeah yeah i i i found it very interesting how they they keep discussing uh, um everything about bangladeshi politics mm. and i was just asking myself the mm-hmm. all these arguments that they give about bangladesh mm-hmm. the on steroids version applies to pakistan exactly precisely the point but they don't have a problem with pakistan they don't have a problem there but they have a problem with bangladesh yeah matlab ye kya hai matlab it almost sounds as if ki class mein char bacche hain ek bacche ko 100 out of 100 milte hain dusre ko 98 out of 100 milte hain aur teesre wo fail hi hota rehta hai wo fail hota hai na to tu to hai hi nikhid kind of a thing but tujhe 98 kyun mile 100 kyun nahi mile <laughs> double standards it, it almost yeah. looks as if you know ha to pakistan to hai but then another thing that geopolitics may is discussed a lot is uh, the world is always going to be having a policeman right global police to hone hi wali hai i mean the i mean look at the history of humanity from a certain time regions have always been dominated by original hegemons regional hegemons whether we like it or not yeah. whether in a monarchical system or whether Which in a democratic, system. democratic system yeah right? yeah Now, as of now, I don't consider India to be a superpower. In no, it's not a superpower. It is not, right? No, it's so not. So you also think India is not a. Superpower. I know it's not a superpower. Yeah, I mean, I think the log by wish. Arey, yeah, yar, log. This is the problem. Our discourse, the state yeah, of our discourse. Okay, uske upar aayenge hum log. But <laughs> so, in in the most realistic version, I, not that I think it is, but what I hear hmm. is like China, hmm. Russia, hmm. and America. अभी रशिया को ऑनेस्टली मैं नहीं गिनता हूँ उनकी मतलब फिस हो चुकी है मगर फिर भी बिकॉज दे हैव द हाईएस्ट नंबर ऑफ न्यूक्लियर वॉरहेड्स ऑन प्लेनेट दैट इज देयर एक्स फैक्टर या वो बेसिकली yeah. मतलब उनका कैसा नेगोशिएशन है ना वो ऐसा वो एक तमंचा लाते हैं ऐसा रखते हैं हाँ अब बात कर अब बात कर अब बात कर दैट्स हाउ दे नेगोशिएट नाउ दैट्स देयर नेगोशिएशन टैक्टिक नाउ इफ द वर्ल्ड इज गोइंग टू बी हैविंग अ पुलिस मैन देन वेयर डू वी le china russia and america in that comparative analysis i wanted to know your view on that mm-hmm. i will share my very open view mm-hmm. i am sympathetic to the idea that india should be the ultimate policeman mm-hmm. but if india is not the policeman i much rather have the west than china and russia i totally concur with that opinion that's how i see it also i don't want to see china be the global police i get scared yeah yeah, yeah. i get scared uh-huh. i would use the word scared meri bahut phatti hai unko dekh ke so how, how does one understand because so i'll tell you what hmm. there was this false image created about you aur tu bolega yaar tere ko ye sab cheeze kahan se pata chalti are bhai main to sunta hu that you are you are a russian agent you are pro russia <laughs> you know what i'm talking about brother. i know what you, you know yeah. and this is why i'm using this podcast uh-huh. and this platform to ask you because see you you will never uh, get asked this question hmm. because most people don't care i care hmm. because i know you hmm. so ye kya tamasha hai why are people making these sorts of insinuations see look the thing is that everybody has certain ideas in their mind ki theek hai the west is right and russia is the bad guy and they have invaded a sovereign nation a defenseless nation and that's why russia is wrong and if you go ahead and explain the history ka bhai ye pichle 1000 varsh ka itihas hai this is the history of the last 1000 years yes. and this these are the things that happened and the, certain promises were made certain uh, agreements were made and then the agreements were breached as soon as they were made and if you if you demonstrate who the actual aggressor is and who is actually pushing back against aggression and that happens to be russia you sh- you say that then people will just react emotionally in india india mein kya hota hai ki everybody has this uh, emotional reaction to everything people don't think logically people think emotionally so they will react emotionally so i am of the view i have put it out multiple times that russia is the uh, not the aggressor it's the us that's the aggressor and the ukraine country that nato nato basically. nato is owned by the us america they have the veto in nato they own the they own nato okay so uh, so ukraine the ukraine conflict is just a proxy conflict i mean i you know people uh, when you when you go back in history and you talk about the iran iraq conflict you see that as the conflict between uh, saddam hussein and the, and khomeini it even that was actually a proxy conflict which was instigated by the americans and there have been so many different person agree with you so ukraine is a proxy conflict and they wanted to bleed russia and and slowly sap away russia's ability to exist but the 
opposite has happened because clearly the Russians were planning for this for a very long time. So they also were planning for this. And it started with the Crimea thing when they were caught unawares. And they were even, Putin was fooled by Merkel as well. I mean, he kind of trusted her and believed her. But overall, the thing is that the Russians are not the aggressor. They are simply, uh, you know, pushing back when certain red lines have been crossed. Power has pressure. And NATO is really powerful. And Russia's real power comes from its nukes. So they have laid down some red lines and they are trying to, uh, you know, essentially they, they, they will wait as long as possible until Ukraine is no longer able to fight and then the West will go and do something else. So that's how I see it. I don't see Russia as the aggressor. I see Russia as the victim. And I have said this and that's why people said that I'm a Russian agent. I mean, I'm, I'm sure some people say that. I mean, I just put forth my opinion and my analysis. It doesn't mean that I'm this agent or that agent. I mean, I'm, <laughs> why do people attribute motives to this? It's just analysis. So one more question I wanted to ask, mm. like my view on, you know, this criticism levied to India about mm. buying Russian oil. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think I have heard many ridiculous things in my life. This tops the most ridiculous thing I have heard in my life. Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't have to say that you तुम झगड़ा कर रहे हो हमको क्या लेना देना है उनसे exactly. हम तो सस्ता तेल लेंगे अच्छा hmm. मजे की बात है दे बाय द सेम प्रोसेस्ड ऑयल फ्रॉम अस उसमें उनकी मोरालिटी नहीं हिलती नहीं 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 सिलेक्टिव मोरालिटी उनकी मोरालिटी नहीं हिलती है आ मेरे को लगता है एंड करेक्ट मी इफ आई एम रॉन्ग बिकॉज़ सी आई एम नॉट वेरी वेल वर्स्ड विद दिस आई थिंक जर्मनी एंड अ लॉट ऑफ यूरोपियन नेशंस आर बाइंग तगड़ा ऑयल फ्रॉम अस we process is, but uh, even the americans i believe are buying yeah. processed oil to matlab humse processed oil kharidoge so suddenly what happens is the idea of buying unprocessed oil is uh, wo kya bolte hain haram and the <laughs> idea of buying processed oil is halal right <laughs> that's what they're saying or am i have a completely misunderstood this no that's that's exactly what's happening that's exactly what's happening so yeah. that's bullshit right it is see look you know you have to earn the right to be hypocrite in international relations okay explain this this is interesting so look in the past the us so, uh, typically would uh, walk the talk. Whatever they preached, they would uh, actually practice to a certain extent, ex except for places like Africa, which nobody knew about what was happening there. So they would walk the talk. But today what you're seeing is that they are openly hypocritical. They've opened double standards. They'll say one thing and do the exact opposite. Uh, for example, you don't just walk away unilaterally from an agreement that you signed. The, one, uh, the, the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, they just walked away unilaterally from that. And that essentially, essentially must have pushed Iran into developing nuclear weapons by now, possibly, possibly. So, what you what you see is that the Americans are now unabashedly and opening openly flaunting their power. That we are the most powerful nation on the planet, and we'll do whatever the hell we feel like. We'll tell you to do something, but we'll tell the other guy to do the exact opposite. And we mm. want both to hold, and you both need to obey what we say. Otherwise, there'll be consequences. So they have earned the right to be hypocritical by being so through through gaining so much power mm -hmm. but the problem is that it's it's a uh, very severely dented their image image also matters image matters your reputation matters if you are no longer seen as having any level of uh, of legitimacy then you know it's going to be hard for them to work with other nations nations will you know move away from them at the first uh, available opportunity so that's kind of the way things are going right now the americans are no longer I would say trusted a lot in the mm. in the global community. Everyone knows that they can, uh, the Americans can, you know, destroy any nation when they feel like and, and backstab any nation. So Pakistan is a great example. I mean, Pakistan they had they had uh, abandoned Pakistan, and Pakistan kind of went in, into the lap of China, and then uh, a couple of years ago they had Imran Khan ousted, and now Pakistan is back in the U.S lap so to say so that's the kind of thing that's going on i mean pakistan is that sort of a nation it will go wherever <laughs> you get something so how long do you think nawaz sharif is going to be pm so basically you mean, abhi imran khan is in jail uh -huh. so i mean mere ko to hasi aa rahi hai wala wo jail se seedha pm banega aur fir uski jail ki cell khali hogi to army bolegi acha abhi nawaz sharif ko dal <laughs> I mean, that's that, and you know, the funny thing is, like, we are laughing at this, but this is a realistic chance in Pakistan, yeah, right? It is, it is, yeah. Ki Nawaz Sharif PM to jail and uh, Imran Khan jail to you know, I was reading this uh thing, Ruk ja, ko nikal ke ko de. Uh -huh. it was fascinating. The data this uh, on uh, this uh, freaking thing, 
it was just amazing uh, that this was i read this post uh, somewhere hmm. and i was like hey aisa hota hai pakistan mein but this is their actual history and tell me if uh, this game is right or wrong uh-huh. so uh kahan gaya yaar kahan gaya kahan gaya are yaar she i mean it was like every single prime minister in the history of pakistan has either been bumped off hmm. or jailed there is no single pm in the entire history of this god forsaken country or whatever we want to call it joke i mean i call it a joke temporary nation yeah yeah abhi to nahi kya hai wo wo to matlab sushant to bolta hai pata nahi pakistan is when you mix punjabiyat with islam sushant hamesha bolta hai ye so i just fine and you know the problems i can't even disagree with sushant because that is so true <laughs> so so i mean ye ye kya hai अभी नवाज शरीफ प्राइम मिनिस्टर है क्या अभी हो जाएगा ना अभी जो केयर टेकर है ना वो पता नहीं कौन कौन वो भाई कौन बनाया अभी पिछले छह महीने में दो तो बन चुके हैं उनके सालों के इट रियली डजेंट मैटर एनी मोर आई डोंट इवन पे अटेंशन टू हुज द प्राइम मिनिस्टर इन पाकिस्तान बिकॉज़ द पावर डजेंट रिसाइड देयर एट ऑल सो हाउ डज इट मैटर इट्स जस्ट फॉर शो जस्ट फॉर शो द रियल पावर इज एल्सवेयर इट्स इन द विद द आर्मी द आईएसआई एंड अ बंच ऑफ पीपल सेकंड पॉइंट आई वांट टू टॉक टू यू अबाउट चाइना लेट्स स्पेंड सम टाइम ऑन चाइना नाउ Did you notice their birth rate fall now two years in a row? So, one point zero nine is a TFR. Yeah, yeah. So, what? Like, can we safely conclude that the China story is done now? It is. It it's is. done. You, you, because I didn't know how you feel about it, so yeah. I wanted to ask you uh, your <clears> news, <throat> boss. If your TFR is this low, okay, I still understand one point six, one point seven. Giz giz ke chal loge. Ek to we don't understand because they don't share any data. Mm. that is the biggest problem but now they are also officially saying our population is dropping and their i think average is like 36 36 38 38 38 38 ho gayi aisha so 38 ho gayi mm-hmm. if they are aging at a rate faster than japan apparently it looks like that yeah right now right yeah, yeah. because japan is the most buddha nation of the world mm-hmm. uh, from what i have understood mm-hmm. and correct me if i'm wrong no no i agree yeah so if japan they are aging faster than japan mm-hmm. then where do you see the trajectory of china as a nation because see for us they are the immediate threat pakistan hai but i think pakistan is like that itch on the back yeah that's that's the real part threat part. is china or, or right yeah, so, yeah. so how do we deal with a aging china then so china is going to be a real and, and present threat for india for the next 20 30 years at least mm. okay it's it's still a very powerful nation it's massively more powerful compared to india but yes the tfr is ridiculously low now it's 1.09 uh, children per per average woman which is ridiculous the average median age is 38 or th- whatever it is uh, i've seen various projections done by various uh, organizations and uh, universities and all so they are estimating that by 2100 china's population will be half of what it is today about 700 million 600 million that's the uh, that's the projection that i am seeing from multiple uh, sources and the average age i believe by 2050 could be 2050 or so could be 68 or something what i'm not sure if if i'm remembering correctly but it's going to be much older than what it is right now so what you're going to see so first of all china has a weird society i'll tell you how it's weird okay explain you go this. to china and you meet any person that person will not have any brother or sister that person won't have any uncle or aunt that person won't have any cousins that person one child policy so every child is the last remaining link in your bloodline and they obviously prefer the male child i mean this yeah. is the asian thing that's so messed up so it's so messed up you don't have cousins you don't have uncles you don't have aunts you don't have nephews and nieces you're just a single one line thing and if a family loses their sole child their entire lineage is finished Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the deal, China. So imagine having to send your children to the front lines to fight a war. Oh, they will be very disincentivized. Exactly, and those kids who have to go point. and do that, that's they also yeah, and those kids who have to go to the front lines, they will also try their best not to get killed because that would end their lineage and it would uh, d- destroy their parents' hopes. So you're saying they're not war ready? I'm. I'm sure they'll be. They are war ready. But this is one of the issues that we have to. This, this is a psychological thing. and psychology matters in 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 everything you know so these these are the very real issues that are facing china and you have a slowing growth rate gdp growth rate 
you have uh, various bubbles like the uh, housing bubble and banking bubble and all. I'm I'm sure they would manage. Can you somehow. explain the ghost towns for the benefit of my podcast listeners? Yeah, so China has the. It's known to have this massive, giant ghost towns, big apartment buildings, you know, multi-storied buildings, 20, 30 stories and all. Entire townships built like this and no one lives there. Okay. So, you know, government money is available. You want to spend it. You want to keep some of it. So you go and do all this stuff. But then nobody comes and buys it for, because first of all, it's very expensive. It is priced so high that nobody can afford it. Uh-huh. And secondly... People don't want to live in that place. They want to go and uh, work in a big city. Yeah, there's no market there. There's right? no market there. There's something yeah. there. So jobs we need. Like. You go to the wilderness and build a whole uh, township there. Who's going to come and live there? So you see this cropping up. It's cropped up all over China. It's mushroomed up. And it, these uh, townships, towns, whatever, are like ghost towns. Nobody lives there. Mm. So yeah, that, that's one of the things that you see in China. It's because of this overzealous government policy of just throw money at things. And maybe that will solve problems. So that's one of the issues in China. So we have, and now they have obviously ended officially the one child policy, but it's already too late in my opinion. I think it's so already People are just used to it. I think, you know, one phenomenon that was, that was not, noticed during the COVID days, mm-hmm. when China had this horrifically harsh lockdowns, is that people start, I mean, people could not even protest. They were not even allowed to protest. People went out with blank pages to protest, even that was not allowed. Okay, they didn't write anything. It's, they just put out, put out blank pages. Uh, even that was not allowed. Then people started, you know, the last form of protest, which is not having children. We simply won't have children. That, that, that is how we protest against China, against the Chinese Communist Party. So you will notice if you look at the TFR figures, birth rate figures and all that, that the TFR dropped precipitously during those past two or three years when COVID was there and China had this... The Chinese vaccine didn't work, first of all. And they had this horrific lockdowns in China. Months on end. So that has contributed greatly, I would imagine, to the drop in the, in the, in the TFR. So overall, if you look at long-term projections, the China story doesn't look good. It's not the Chinese century anymore. Now they call it the Asian century because they don't want to, they don't want to say Indian century. So now it's the Asian century. But it's not going to be the China story. China, uh, right now, it's a powerful nation. Uh, if you look at the Chinese overall strength, it's like four or five times that of India. If you combine military and economic and mm. all that. So China is still way stronger than India. And India is going to take a lot of time to come close to where China is. I mean, we have a, we, they've had a 30 year head start uh, ahead of us. And their system is much more, uh, you know, it gets things done much faster than ours. Mm. So China has lots of advantages. But in the long run, if we get our, deal right if we get uh, you know uh, our house in order then by 2100 will be probably the largest power and most powerful nation in the world but this is where the state of our discourse comes uh-huh. why do we lie to ourselves about what or where we lie today why why does see i wanted to talk geopolitics so that i can connect it all uh-huh. eventually to the standard of discourse in india mm-hmm. where if I was to say realistically that at the geopolitical pecking order today, yeah, we can probably bully a Canada. Yeah, we can bully even the United uh, Kingdom. We can we can diss them, you know. The, yeah, we can diss them. We can't really bully, bully them, because, them. Yeah, yeah. So how? Um, why do we lie to ourselves? And why are so many people on the content landscape? Forget mainstream media. Look at YouTube where people make outlandish claims Mm -hmm. about India and where India is going. Like, I'm very bullish on India. I am too. Yes, absolutely. Very bullish on India. But I'm also realistic about where we are today. Yeah. Like, uh, where, why, what drives us to lie and misinform our own people? And the next half of our discussion will be more about the morality and ethics of content creation, which I want to talk about eventually. But... Because you discuss geopolitics, I discuss without geo only politics, <laughs> local politics. And it's a tough job where mm-hmm. when you're doing these things and then I don't know what word should I use, but your colleagues mm-hmm. and a significant se- section of your colleagues. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about mainstream media. I have a very low opinion of mainstream in the first place. Mm-hmm. But I'm talking about social media content creation, mm-hmm. whether it's YouTube, whether it's Instagram, not in India, but globally to hai na. Mm-hmm. Whether it's uh, inst- uh, you know, matlab, sorry, TikTok, Instagram to hai, uh-huh. TikTok nahi hai hai pe. Yeah. So all these things that exist, 
you hear absolutely batshit crazy hmm? views that india actually has all the answers hmm? whether in the realm of geopolitics whether in the realm of politics whether in the realm of culture in any realm we have all the answers hmm. if we have all the answers chalo i take the argument that we were colonized hmm. i understand colonization has real world effects and i'm not even negating it hmm. but it's been 75 years right hmm. abhi wo to chale gaye hmm. hum to yahi hai ab ye to nahi bol sakte na congress ne ye kya bhai congress hai to indian hi na congress koi thodi na koi chinese hai jo yahan pe baith ke kar raha hai ya congress thodi na koi pakistani hai bhai wo indian citizens hi hai aur india ke log hi unko vote kar rahe hain ya jo bhi kar rahe hain till when do you think and why do you think there is a section that i don't know if it misguide is the right word but they basically kind of misguide people about the state of our society you know what i get the feeling that many of these people who are like you said misguiding the mm. society they themselves have no idea of what's going on look you need to be really well informed in in order to be able to talk about certain things i don't talk about things that i don't have any understanding of i just stay away from the, from that so the first thing is that i i mean according to me you should talk about only what you are really clear about and what you really know today what's happening is that uh, people have no idea of uh, see the ukraine conflict happened within a month or so everybody became a ukraine expert, expert. okay now this manipur situation happened within a month or two everyone was a manipur expert now the middle east thing happened now everyone's a middle east expert that's not how it works you need to have a proper understanding you, you can't start just start opining about things this is like the surfing the wave yeah, you know? and for the record when i was recording that podcast with rami for the first time on manipur if you huh? remember i had reached out to you yeah, yeah i remember yes. and i had told me abhijit sare questions de jo tu mm. chahta hai main cover karu mm. because i knew you knew more than i did mm. i did that i mean i just want to clarify it and put it on the record that i did reach out to you yeah. and and you know uh, to your credit you gave me a lot of material. a long list oh yeah you gave yeah. me a long list and i tried to cover as much as i could from that mm. many things were answered indirectly through rami but then if you can do this i can do this we don't even think we look at each other as competitors we no. look at each other as colleagues yeah are you disappointed at the way others are behaving no i'm not disappointed i understand human nature look many of them aren't even bad people many of them don't even know they are doing something wrong that's how i see it look most people i believe are genuinely nice people many of them are trying to make a living many of them want fame adulation or whatever relevance okay and they perhaps do some research and ah mujhe ab mil gaya jawab i can go and talk about it but there is no depth to their analysis unfortunately which is very obvious the moment you hear a few words come out of so and so person's mouth so that is the standard of discourse in india there is no depth to it and there's this knee jerk reactions to everything okay something has happened now let's go and talk about it you will see various uh, content creators the three or four days after something happens there's a video coming out on that and they are the expert i mean that's not how <laughs> how it's done you know so um i what i feel is that uh, people should do proper research and talk about what you know that's the deal and that's uh, how i approach things but then see i'll share my views mm-hmm. on this because i have very strong views mm-hmm. on this obviously and you must have noticed i do have very strong mm-hmm. views on this is because maybe because of my training in mm-hmm. philosophy and even in philosophy is morals and ethics mm-hmm. right i'm obsessed with that i always think about it i look at everything from a moral ethical realm i see i see, I see. it's because... just a default position okay okay, okay. so meri training hi usme hui okay तो मैं हर चीज में वही ढूंढता रहता हूँ कि इज इट मॉरली करेक्ट और एथिकली करेक्ट क्या हमें ये करना चाहिए क्या हमें नहीं करना चाहिए तो मैं हर चीज को इट कुड बी अस इट कुड बी अस वेर आई एम कमिंग फ्रॉम बिकॉज मैं हर चीज को उस रेम से देखता हूँ साउंड क्लाउड नॉट इवन ऑन स्पॉटिफाई और एनी थिंग अच्छा सिर्फ साउंड क्लाउड पे था मेरे को परवाह ही नहीं थी क्या हो रहा था देन समबडी टोल्ड मी यूट्यूब चालू करो देन आई अपलोडेड एवरीथिंग ऑन यूट्यूब देन लो एंड बिहोल्ड इन 2020 1920 द पॉडकास्ट स्टार्टेड गेटिंग अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ ट्रैक्शन नाउ द मोर द पॉडकास्ट बिकम्स रिलेवेंट आई सम हाउ फील दैट इट्स माय मोरल रिस्पांसिबिलिटी दैट एवरी टाइम समथिंग दैट कम्स आउट ऑफ माय माउथ हैज टू बी बैकड अप बाय एविडेंस 
एंड देन व्हेन आई लुक एट अदर पीपल लाइक यू सेड चार दिन के अंदर वो बेसिकली वो क्या है 72 टू आवर रूल या जो होता है ना जो भी, जो भी है कि हुँ. उसके अंदर अगर कोई चीज पेल दो तो क्लिक्स मिलेंगे सबको मालूम है हाँ. सबको मालूम है पीपल प्रिटेंड की नहीं नहीं मैं नहीं कर रहा हूँ भाई तुम कर रहे हो तुम सच बोलो वही कर रहे हो ना आई अवॉइड दैट आई ऑलवेज कॉन्शियसली वेट ताकि मोर फैक्ट्स कम एटलीस्ट एक हफ्ता रुको देखो क्या हो रहा है फिर उसके बाद में बतियाओ उसके बारे में बिकॉज अ लॉर्ड ऑफ यू नो हॉट एयर इज ब्लोन अवे एंड देन इफ यू वॉन्ट फैक्ट्स यू गेट फैक्ट्स ऑन मच लेटर वॉट बॉदर्स मी इज दैट मेन स्ट्रीम मीडिया में लाइक इट और नॉट देर इज स्टिल द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ एन एडिटर इफ आई एम राइटिंग फॉर टाइम्स ऑफ इंडिया टूडे एंड आई सेट दिस इन द मैंगलोर लिट फेस्ट ऑल्सो Listen, I have to go through an editorial process. Yeah, that's right. They will go after me. They will tell me prove this point, prove that point, prove that point. Mm-hmm. Right. Even for example, when I had written that COVID death figures article mm-hmm. for print, uh-huh. right? It's a big digital portal, probably the biggest digital portal of India today. Mm-hmm. Print made me prove every single claim I made. Okay. They made me prove it. Mm-hmm. But there is a huge swath today of not just YouTube. even digital mm. where i know it for a fact that if i write something and i email the pdf document to the editor or sub editor of any portal mm. i'm not talking about right wing i'm talking about right and left both uh-huh. right and left both mm. that portal will literally just copy paste it okay with they will not even check um, typing errors they will not read they will not see what is happening all they will do is they have that title generator software which will give the most bhadkila title okay and that's all and then a person like me and i know i'm taking a little bit of time but i apologize for that mm. but a person like me gets deeply disturbed by something like this mm. where what if i have a 12 paragraph article four paragraphs make sense in the front and then in the end four paragraphs make sense and the other four paragraphs are random gibberish <laughs> and they won't notice that there was research in oxford uh-huh. that showed consumers of content online uh-huh. go by the title barely read the article a huge chunk just shares articles on the basis of the title okay they don't read it mm-hmm. so what they did was they literally typed two paragraphs of actual content and they just typed random gibberish and they still shared the article <laughs> this is not just india mm-hmm. this is in much more quote and quote enlightened societies hamare yahan kya ho raha hoga i wonder yeah yeah if this is the state of our discourse listen our parents generation what did we grow up with big newspaper reading parents yeah i am the way i am because of my parents mm. my parents inculcated the habit of reading in me mm. inculcated the habit of going beyond and having opinions after reading newspaper oh yeah i don't see that in young minds hmm. and somewhere in my mind i feel as a youtuber or a podcast host it is my duty not my job it is my duty moral duty mm-hmm. to tell people ki bhai aise pagal ke jaise kaam mat karo tum nahi to youtube has become the place where people seeking positive affirmation go and find what they like to do hmm. and that's what bothers me so how do we solve this it's a democratic platform and there are no real rules right i mean uh, unless you breach one of the community guidelines or whatever youtube has you're going to be able to do whatever you want mm. uh, there is no oversight and maybe it's a good thing or a bad thing i'm not sure if you involve the government they come up with a bunch of rules that could actually impede what lots of people are doing and maybe some good stuff as well i mean you know it's typically bureaucrats who say who come up with rules and they are often very heavy handed with stuff so uh, I I don't see a solution right now. I don't see a solution to this. People are free to do whatever they want as long as they don't uh, cross certain lines. So yeah, it it just it's a barometer of the standards of our demographic, our, our demographic standards of our, the standards of our people. And it all boils down to the education system and the short atten- attention spans that people have scrolling endlessly on whatever Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is. So that's why this uh, this tendency to just look at the title and share stuff would have come come from I suppose. And people don't want to read stuff. They want to just I don't know. I don't know what the what the mentality is like right now, especially among the youngsters. It's all about the dopamine hit. that they just want to keep on getting that 
so uh, that's why short form content is prolif pro proliferating on social media there are all these short form content platforms tiktok instagram uh, reels or whatever it is youtube shorts is a big thing and you should see the kind of audience you get from shorts you know a very different kind of audience uh, and I mean, all that you're being nice here <laughs> yeah i mean yeah so uh, i think i mean as a responsible person as a responsible creator you should have some moral guidelines of your own uh, some standard operating procedures of your own you should not do certain things but i guess uh, each to each their own i guess that's what i would say i mean there's no solution to this where i am scared is mm. that if we as a community mm. i i think we are a community community of content creators whether on youtube mm. whether on instagram if we as a community don't start having these discussions mm. the freaking government will uh -huh. and when the government will we will not like it yeah it's going to be heavy handed if they it come is, yeah and if they come in so which is why i have been trying to reach out to all kinds of content creators mm -hmm. uh, i have discussed this with not just you with vinamra mm -hmm. prakhar many others and uh -huh. i have said we need to start chatting with each other mm -hmm. about what do we see ourselves as mm -hmm. because aaj hum x pe hain abhi log ignore kar rahe hain Mm -hmm. eventually this is going to be the thing where everybody consumes news mm -hmm. like in the united states of america cnbc msnbc ya jo bhi unke channels hai fox cnn uh -huh. yo bhi hai yeah. unko 65 and above log dekhte hain <laughs> i see i see i see the youth is listening to podcast going on youtube mm -hmm. they are consuming content on tiktok and okay. all that mm -hmm. so they are having serious discussions about how do we go about this shit uh -huh. like whether it's uh, tucker carlson and you know they do have these chats and mm. they they i know tucker carlson and ben shapiro had this thing back and forth where they attacked each other on this israel thing okay when ben was like but the point is at least there is some level of discourse uh -huh. there even amongst the community because i've asked a few of them even on substackers right substackers also have this because see substack me again the problem is you're writing long essays nobody is editing it mm, yeah you're just posting it on substack right that's right yeah now the more i in principle i agree with the idea that jitna democratize karoge utna acha hai because i have come across far better writers on substack now mm. than maybe mainstream portals okay i, I think substack has some especially science substack is this like a heaven okay is a heaven i see science substack but then at the same time i know some of them personally so i know they go through the rigor mm. and they also write for mainstream media okay. so they follow the same rigor of mainstream media in their on own substack. public on okay. on substack mm. but then a lot of these young kids they just uh, consume any kind of rubbish they don't know what's right what's wrong they don't know what's quality and what's not quality so do you think we have to now start creating those tools and telling these kids that boss there are certain rules you, it, do they tick them like first principles or something of that sort <laughs> first principles uh you know this this uh, tells us what is the quality of our of our audience unfortunately uh, how do you tell kids what rules they should follow and why should they listen to us is the main question they want unfortunately mm. i mean that, that is the problem the most important demographic that we have is the below 18 demographic because they are they are the ones who will essentially be running the country in a couple of decades mm. so it's it's essential that we somehow ensure that they are on the right path and but the question is how do you do it i i i think we i mean let's say there are five or 10 of us yeah i'm 40 and above uh -huh. yeah so meri to koi sunega nahi that's the point no the point is that listen even if 10 of us get together and we decide that okay we're going to follow so and so standards and we write it down and we take a note okay, we will follow the standards it's going to be just the 10 of us there's going to be a whole bunch of people out there who are chasing views chasing fame chasing whatever they are they're chasing and they're going to do whatever it takes to to do that so how do you deal with that what you really need is a discerning society who can tell what's right from wrong but we don't have that see there is this uh, this uh, this uh, lack of ability to think critically in india we all react emotionally we don't think dispassionately and analyze issues and especially kids they don't do that so then the question is how do we reach out to them how do we change this entire situation in towards something better i'm not sure what the solution is yeah and i mean as i hear you saying this is such a depressing reality that you we actually don't know what to do because at the end of the day i don't want the government coming in 
and then we just go through the natural evolutionary process of let uh, nature sort itself out and the filtration happen but yeah the filtration is going to take a lot of time because our schooling system and i remember terrible, terrible, yeah, it's yeah. terrible mm. which is which is i think i remember when we were in mangalore we did have this discussion and mm. i completely um i agree with you that somewhere down the line this malaise is because of the indian schooling system it's because of the education system that's the root cause of all this malaise that's the root cause that's why you have kids who can't think who don't know how to think they don't even know how to think so what what are we going to do with them right and this this system is churning out generation after generation millions and millions of kids who lack the mental ability to discern right from wrong they can't think critically they don't know what principles are or let alone first principles they know nothing they go out into the world knowing nothing at all clueless and then they end up being misled by whoever whatever appeals to them through their emotions it's all about emotions so the question is what do you do i mean i wish there were more scientists in india who would do podcasts who would you know uh, more people from other fields arts whatever then you could have a slightly elevated kind of discussion. why don't we have our own neil degrasse tyson i don't know I or mean, carl sagan well i have tried uh, doing uh, science podcasts and all what you what you see is that people are not interested in science i mean you know okay, like, spend yeah. some time on this explain uh, kar ye kyon ho raha hai Okay, because science perhaps isn't. In, if you talk about aliens, <laughs> oh yes, 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 views. <laughs> But how long will you talk about aliens? There is no proof of aliens. I mean, there is no point talking about aliens. It's all speculation. If you talk about hard science, then well, people are like, "Ye sab kya baat kar rahe?" Talk about something else. So, so that's what it is. I mean, people are like, sadly, like sheep. They don't want to. I think it hurts to think for most people. it hurts perhaps and when you come up with the, when you talk about difficult topics then they just you know tune off tune out and they'll click away and watch something else so how do we make science cool then here okay to appeal to the indian audience you'll need flashy graphics and you'll have to make it masaledar and all that i guess that's the way to do it i mean i don't see any other solution i, I that's not what appeals to me i mean you know but uh, i'm sure there are lots of science lovers lovers in this country but uh, they seem to be in fact one of my biggest complaints with you has been i always used to tell you ki you have a formal training in the science mm. background yeah you are trained in that you you have even published uh you, you have to do it who else i guess i have to do it then <laughs> i mean in fact I, you you know you once asked me what is your criticism of me and i had told you that you don't do enough science that was my I, only criticism i was doing weekly science live streams you yeah. know i i did that for a long time i must have like i don't know how many but that's a significant number of purely science live streams i did a lot of those but um, eventually you find that uh, you can see how many people are live watching you right when you're doing history or geopolitics or whatever you get a certain number when you're doing science you get one fifth of that and that's that's a pattern i saw over and over and over again people are just not interested in that so then I, i i was wondering what's the point of doing this nobody has any interest in this i find science fascinating i don't mind talking about science every single day i don't mind live streaming about uh, streaming about science every day taking questions ask me questions i'll answer your questions but it doesn't appeal to the audience right now so that's all about the standards i keep telling people raise your standards challenge yourselves do things that are difficult not things that are easy but um, i'm not sure how how far that is it is a engineer kyun aate hai fir hamare kahan pe ये इतने बच्चे इंजीनियरिंग की करते हैं तो वो साइंस नहीं पढ़ते उनको इंटरेस्ट नहीं चाहिए साइंस में दे वांट जॉब्स इंजीनियरिंग इज जस्ट मैकेनिक्स राइट उसमें देयर इज नो देयर इज नो आई मीन यू नो इट्स इट्स नॉट थ्योरेटिकल फिजिक्स इट्स नॉट अबाउट चेंजिंग द अननोन इट्स नॉट गोइंग टू द ब्लीडिंग एज ऑफ साइंस एंड गोइंग टू द रियल वेयर द द नोन एंड द अननोन मीट एंड यू नो एनीथिंग इज पॉसिबल दैट दैट चैलेंज इज इन देयर Engineering is all about the simple hard facts and solving certain equations and all that. You know, adding forces and vectors and all. That's like, <laughs> you know, it, it, there's nothing fascinating or thrilling about that or engineering. I mean, I'm, I'm, I apologize to any engineers who may be watching. All the engineers are like, "Hey, Abhijit, you have said this. How do you say it?" Look, applied science never appealed to me. Look, I I have my own biases. I totally. Uh, I'm aware of it that I am biased towards theoretical physics and stuff. I find engineering dull, and boring, and drab, and all that. <laughs> Electronics engineering, please keep it away from me. I used to, you know, find those subjects very boring. I'm sure people find it fascinating, but that's not me. 
but you know when you talk about Neil deGrasse Tyson he talks about theoretical physics he he talks about what is you know the intersection of the known and the unknown well he has a huge audience out there but there doesn't seem to be an audience over here that's interested in that sort of stuff unless you're a celebrity like Neil deGrasse Tyson and they'll they'll watch that i don't know what what the motivation is so 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 two more questions and then we'll start taking the live stream questions right. so so where do we stand on AIT, OIT, AMT? AIT, OIT, AMT. That was our first discussion. That was the thing, right? That's yeah. where, we all, uh, where it all started. So Lazaridis and Hegarty papers have come out. I shared those papers. With you me. did, but I still haven't read them. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've, I've kind of lost touch with AIT. I don't know what's happening like currently. Okay. Uh, what is, we know very well that you cannot really establish a undeniable linkage between mm. genetics and language or religion or culture. Mm. So we don't know where Hinduism and Sanskrit and all that originated. I mean, logically, it makes sense that it would originate in India, but we simply have no means of knowing. Mm. And it's I, I think it's, it doesn't make sense to try and connect it with uh, genetic information. I, I'm sure interesting stuff has come out in recent times. You shared that uh, a couple of papers with me. Uh, so I will try and catch up with those. But uh, overall, this seems to be a pointless, futile exercise to mm. me. You know, it's it's totally, I mean, people just keep on fighting for no reason. Uh, at the end of the day, you will not be able to prove or disprove things which happened like 10, 15, 20,000 years ago. Uh, you can do the genetic stuff and you may find more genetic markers and, and more evidence. But the language and the religion, how do you establish where that began? Unless you find completely unambiguous evidence somehow. Mm. So... I have been, I've kind of, you know, drifted away from this topic. It's still a fascinating topic. I don't mind revisiting it uh, at all. I don't mind it at all. But right now, I'm not quite in touch with what's going on in that. And the genetic stuff is going to go on and on. Yeah. They're going to keep on finding new stuff and they're going to keep on revising their their uh, point of origin or whatever it is. I mean, okay, okay but let's say the oldest uh, evidence we, I mean, the oldest genetic lineage, lineage we found was from Iran. But what is that lineage's ancestry? Where did that come from? You, can, you have to keep on tracing it back to some place, right? Mm. And it's going to just take us on our nice merry-go-round. God knows where it will end up. And what's the point of doing that? Mm. I mean, as a geneticist, you have to do that. It's your job. I'm sure it's interesting. But for me, I'm actually more interested in, in, in the origin of the language and the culture. And that, I don't see any solution for that. I don't, I don't see that getting resolved. Yeah. Fair enough. Now, this is my last question and then we'll start taking. Now, one thing I'm very fascinated about is this whole idea about people fighting over figures of the past. Uh -huh. Now, you, you, uh, uh, you've you gotten into debates about Gandhi. You uh -huh. made certain comments about Gandhi. Uh -huh. uh, whether I disagree or agree with that is not the question. My question is about the ball, broad meta way of looking at historical figures from the past. Now, I've done a monologue explaining how I would look at a figure. Now, my biggest uh, problem when we analyze historical figures is, and give me some time to explain in yeah, front sure. of you, yeah. um, is that we have to do a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis being we look, where what I find is whether people are pro a figure or anti a figure, I, I, I see people do a lot of quote mining. Mm -hmm. So let's say if I am pro Godse, uh -huh. I'm just giving a hypothetical yeah. because today is uh, the anniversary of one of the most horrific uh, okay, okay. mob killings um, mm. uh, of Brahmins, Chitpavan Brahmins mm. in, in Maharashtra. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but it did happen because Godse killed Gandhiji and because Gandhiji was murdered by Godse, uh, for some odd reason which I have not understood mm. and it was uh, something that uh, should be condemned yeah now the point is that even if I look at Gandhiji right like how do I analyze what Gandhiji was like uh, what I see is people who like Gandhiji for mm. example um, Sitaram Goel was very pro Gandhi okay right? I was not aware Sitaram Goel was very pro Gandhi I see and uh, there are many who are very pro Gandhi. So let's say Dr. Makran Paranjpe is very pro Gandhi. Okay. Now, uh, when I read his books, I will find quotes that show Gandhi in a very good light. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying those quotes are mm -hmm. fake. These are real quotes. I'm sure they're real quotes. They are real of quotes. Of course, yeah. Then if I go to someone who is not a fan of Gandhi, mm -hmm. I will see all the Gandhi quotes mm -hmm. that are problematic. Mm -hmm. How do we judge Gandhi? I know. Or any, yeah. any historical figure. Like, uh -huh. how do we judge that person? Yeah, I have my own methodology of uh, yeah, analyzing so, so how do you do it? Take any historical figure, okay. typically a leader, mm. a prominent leader. Mm. How do you judge that person? I'll tell you how to judge that person. 
you have to completely ignore whatever they said or wrote only focus on what they did actions hmm. what were the consequences of those actions hmm. that's all i care about hmm. i don't care what they wrote and what the intention their intentions were you know the the cliche the road to hell is paved with good intentions hmm. so i don't care about what their intentions were i don't care what they said what speeches they gave how good an orator he or she was i don't care what their quotes were i only care about what what actions they they undertook and what were the consequences of those actions because look a leader's a leader's only job they have one job ensure the long term security and prosperity of your nation and your people that's all that matters as a leader it doesn't matter what your opinions are or what you, what wonderful things you said it doesn't matter so i'm a realist i only look at actions and the consequences of those actions and that is how i judge a leader so yes. how do we measure those things in how, quantifiable terms then yeah you can i mean see a, a leader's career mm -hmm. is a, is a very well examined so for example mr gandhi mm -hmm. let's take mr gandhi he said that partition will happen over my dead body all right wonderful words but did he do anything to stop partition fasting isn't action it's it's passivity mm. he was probably the most influential and most powerful politician in of his time of his time right i mean one word from him and people would go and stand in front of the lathis or bullets mm -hmm. they would just stand and all that why could i mean just i'm just saying why could he not have ordered or requested the police force and the military the british in an army to go on strike non violence karo hmm. satyagraha karo why only the people who anyway don't have any power the instruments of power the real instruments of power that the british held were the police force and the armed forces that's how they maintained their hold over the country and of course the bureaucracy and, all and that. that's how they eventually had to go right because of the naval mutiny and stuff yeah like the that. naval the naval rebellion was a huge uh, huge wake up call for them and they just scattered out of you know out of india as soon as they could after that and that's why the partition i mean the so called independence was brought brought forward to 47 it was supposed to be somewhat later i believe but uh, so the point is we know exactly what actions leaders have taken mm. and what actions they did not take and that's how a how that's the basis on which i judge leaders that's it so so what made you say that uh, in your opinion mahatma gandhi was a british agent then <laughs> no i i, I don't, don't want, I mean to put you on the no, spot no, 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 because yeah. i mean you won't up to it so no, no it's it's a yeah it's a fair question yeah look if you were as powerful a leader as mr gandhi was uh when did he return to india from south africa was it 1915 or so roughly 1916 i 15, don't remember 16 whatever i don't remember the exact year right so what, mr gandhi comes back to india he is overnight becomes the most uh, popular uh, leader in the congress party then he finds that his western dress isn't appealing to the indians hmm. so he, then he changes his entire attire he, yeah, he yeah. becomes indian and then he goes on a one or two year train journey around india mm -hmm. right to understand india to get back in contact with the, with, with the grassroots and all that and after a couple of years he's genuinely made all the networks all the contacts all that and is the genuinely most powerful leader in the congress party right and everyone respects him people almost worship him like a saint mm. so in 1920 he could have okay look he did participate in military operations in south africa the boer war the boer war he in was a sergeant naval general. corps or, or the corps the medical corps yeah he was a sergeant major mm. so he had experience of military combat and he did enlist try to enlist as many indians as possible to fight for the british in world war 1 all right so if since he was so influential and powerful and people would do whatever he said why didn't he i mean just i'm just saying why didn't he give out the order the clarion call all indians tomorrow you come out and your job is to kill one british person and go home just kill one and go home and if in if he had done that then within 24 hours there would have been no british left in india and india would have been free maybe uh, to give you a counter to that hmm. maybe he truly was a true believer in pacifism okay well that does that doesn't serve your nation since yeah he, he, his reasons were bad but then how does it make him a british agent look i'll tell you what i'll tell you what your personal beliefs are immaterial compared to the national interest I agree with you. Yeah. And I I am not defending Mahatma Gandhi. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying yours. I'm saying anyone as a leader. Yeah. I'm not I'm not uh, talking. I'm saying how do we get to the British agent bit? Yeah, so he delayed India's independence. He delayed it. 
he could have had, you know achieved independence through bloody or violent means by 1920 or 25 but he just kept on you know what he he acted as a pressure release valve when it comes when it comes to the british so they created we know the british created the congress party alan hume was the founder yeah, right? yeah. we know that and the congress party the top leadership the top brass you know the creme de la creme was always english educated british educated and very pro britain except for one person as, I, as far as i know mr patel he wasn't english educated british educated so the top elite leadership was always british educated so the congress party after see the british after what they what they experienced in 1857 they knew that they had to find a way to shepherd the freedom aspirations of india in a certain direction which would be a non violent direction mm. and i believe that the british observed mr gandhi very closely for 20 25 years whatever time he was in south africa and uh, it looks like he was promoted to come to india and take over the leadership of congress yeah, party do we have any evidence no we have that? no evidence it's just logic obviously you don't need to agree with that that's you know but the the logic makes sense so basically and you know what you can you can even have somebody act on your behalf without without the person knowing that he or she is doing that you know you can just use people like that it's just that uh, to me i think gandhi had some weird ideas mm. pacifism i think is the most illogical thing <laughs> especially gandhi and pacifism it just makes no sense to me uh, i believe in a no first strike policy on most occasions but mm. agar tum mere ko punch maroge main to chhodunga the british were starving indians millions yeah. of indians i yeah. mean that was I mean, I mean, it's a foreign occupation is a legitimate cause for war yeah so uh, i'm 100% with you on there mm. where i may slightly disagree mm-hmm. with you and it's fine i mean it's the free world we can disagree yeah. is that i don't know if gandhi was a british agent can be proved categorically what can be proved is he had some really weird ideas oh he showed sure it and the british were smart enough to know is aadmi ko prop karte raho because he serves our purpose way more but when he serves your purpose is your agent yeah so oh. he, even he was a agent without signing up for the thing it's possible but yeah. he was any with the agent yeah. so, i mean if you look at okay the now i understand what you mean to say hmm. because i could not understand what you said on beer visors okay look when you watch a 60 second video wo mere ko samajh mein nahi aata the context is missing now i understand now in that sense even if he did not sign up for it but the british was like ye banda hamare kaam ka hai isko prop up karte raho oh let it go i actually pretty much agree with you on that i i think i agree with you uh, because i think the point is that gandhian philosophy hmm. was a very convenient tool for the british to very, extend yeah it, it, it was perfect for them and eventually if it was not for subhash chandra bose bhagat singh and many others yeah. and eventually you know it leading to the naval rebellion hmm. i don't think so the british would do have know, gone do you know mr gandhi's attitude towards the rebellion he yeah, condemned it yeah he de- demoralized them oh what did he do in the mopla massacre <laughs> I mean, his statements during the Mopla. I mean, mass- if you look at he the supports pattern, the Khilafat, opposes the Mopla massacre. Look at the pattern of actions. Forget about his words, his, his writings. Yeah. Just look at his actions. There's a pattern over and over and over yeah. again, a repeated pattern. And the British never saw. I mean, they never saw it fit to send him to Kalapani. Wasn't he that dangerous for them? He would. He eventually got. Was Nehru sent to Kalapani? Nobody was sent to Kalapani. Only only Savarkar. Only Savarkar was sent. To <laughs> so convenient right oh, yeah, the only yeah. person who was sent to kalapani was savarkar everybody yeah. else was said are you here why five star jail boss five star jail mein raho goat milk and what not who, morning walk who was the person who had said the cost of maintaining uh, so, the pow- poverty of gandhi costed more than most people so did. mr gandhi made it a point to only travel third class the only thing is that he had the whole compartment to himself and another <laughs> compartment for his retinue so his third class was first class he had third class no, this is this is known this is this is a known fact yeah why don't people look it up instead of getting emotional and upset about this look it up right google hey mm. use it see now see so now i understand like uh, i think this is a fair point that you have made eventually what are the reasons uh, and what are the first order second order third order effects of your actions mm. and that's how i judge you i i, I think that's a fair measurement criteria it's a realistic way of looking at things that's yeah. how i look at things i mean i look at things from the perspective of, of of what a leader is supposed to do what their actions are and what are the consequences that's i mean i i want to keep things simple i don't want to get into you know multi level complexity and all that keep things simple the leader's job is so and so what are the actions and what were the consequences did they achieve what they were supposed to achieve or did they do something which had the opposite effect mm. that's how i judge a leader and he his or her legacy 
no i think that's uh, that's fair i just wanted to understand yeah, your sure. perspective yeah. and i think uh, i also wanted to give you the opportunity to explain this perspective because a lot yeah. of people have misunderstood you okay i'm sure they'll still misunderstand me that's no, all right but at <laughs> least now you have an uh, you have a detailed explanation of this thing right at least now you have it well, thank uh, you so. for doing this then <laughs> no i mean what else am i supposed to do so now let's take uh, the questions all now right. uh, okay Okay, this is good. Okay, Bol, how do you memorize whatever you have read? At least the important bits. Make notes, bookmarks. That's the toughest part for me. So you go for. Okay, how, how do I memorize stuff? I don't. When I so I have read so many books that I don't remember at all. Hmm. So when I read a book, my philosophy is very very simple, simplistic. Me sida admi ho. Okay, I give myself permission to forget everything. Hmm. Okay, so I read the book. If I don't find it interesting, I'll remember nothing. That way, I remember things that were interesting in the book, hmm. at least what was interesting to me. So those are the things that stick in my mind. I don't have to memorize that, and I I give myself permission to read a book. I mean, just a chapter or two if needed. I don't have to read the whole book. So whatever catches my interest is something I'll remember, and the rest of it I'll forget. I mean, I read a book about Salah Adina Yubi. I don't remember a word of it. Okay, so I mean. I, I'm sure the book was good or whatever but that's that's my philosophy i give myself permission to forget everything have you gone through this process that you read and then you park it somewhere in your brain yeah but suddenly when the discussion of the thing comes it all comes back yeah it happens have you yeah. gone through that yeah it happens it happens all the time with me <laughs> like i must have read something 10 years ago oh yeah 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 it pops up it is like thad agar ke suddenly brain ke kisi corner se wo aa jata hai wo almari mein se wo nikalti hai book aur wo it's almost as if you know i had compartmentalized it somewhere and then then i remember ha maine ha mujhe naam yaad nahi hai then i have to google are naam kya tha and then i immediately google it and it pops up it helps me in researching better because i know where to go hmm. so i was like i thought uh, where is there something wrong with me <laughs> <laughs> hmm Okay, so what is the next one? Can can't it be that can it be that the U.S. and West is in cahoots with India to bypass some of the oil crisis and at the same time moral policing just for optics win-win? This is actually a good question. Good question. I, I actually would not put it outside the. No, purview. I would not. I would not. This is actually a great question. Yeah, this is a good question. So yeah, both of us are in <laughs> agreement on that one. Yeah, I think okay, okay. Take a talk on Gyan Vapi Vyas Treasury Puja allowed. A- exercise devil strike in bengal also indian navy rescues near somalia iranians and pakistanis rescued okay i didn't know about the iranian navy i know only that i don't know any, anything any of the other stuff no yeah so today we had the news segment so for people who don't know and and this is very important and uh-huh. let me share this information yeah. with our audiences that there is a mythology that has been peddled that gyanwapi mein puja hi nahi hoti thi until the mulayam singh yadav government hmm? stopped the puja in the gyanwapi complex i think it was in the basement where we would do puja daily as a community uh, when was it stopped 90s 90s lam sang yeah i think around 30 odd years ago okay jab ye band ki gayi mm-hmm. and today the court gave a judgment to restart the puja in 7 days it's a monumental verdict oh, wow, something okay. i wholeheartedly support mm-hmm. wholeheartedly endorse and uh, the lie that has been peddled mm-hmm. uh, i mean i recently i did a monologue where i said you know often we talk about the islamist barbarians i'm not giving them a free pass i'm not giving mm-hmm. them a free pass they are obviously the primary culprits in this entire shit show that we have as a, in our society but when will we lay the blame i remember con- reading conrad els years ago mm-hmm. on this ayodhya conflict his book okay and conrad showed that there was a time when the muslim side was actually yaar table pe aake baat karte hain ram janma bhoomi ki and it was all these marxist historians uh uh-huh. that chabi lagaud this entire community okay and all india muslim personal law board ko laake jhoot pe jhoot jhoot pe jhoot jhoot pe jhoot the courts would tell them aake debate karo aur apni evidence do they would always take tarikh pe tarikh because they did not have any evidence to show and apna side would you know make proper translations of persian records arabic records go with them and and i am shocked That, हमारे आज के बच्चों को यह भी नहीं मालूम था कि ज्ञानवापी कॉम्प्लेक्स में पूजा हो रही थी और बंद सिर्फ कुछ तीस चालीस साल के पहले ही हुई है अच्छा और आज जब वापस चालू हुई है तो लोग बोल रहे हैं हाँ हाँ फाइनली हम जीत गए अरे हम तो हमेशा कर रहे थे सर अच्छा अच्छा नो दिस एंड दिस इज सो स्केरी हाउ शॉर्ट हाउ ब्रीफ और मेमोरी इतना डर लगता है मुझे 
कि अगर हमें ये भी नहीं मालूम है बच्चों को तीस साल पहले की बात तीस साल पहले की बात तो दो सौ साल तीन सौ साल पहले तो मतलब इट इज द फ्री रेंज जो चेपना है चेप दो तो ये लोग ने क्या क्या चेपा होगा क्या मालूम टोटली दैट्स वॉट स्केयर सो ओके Digital plus new process launched for digital judiciary. Now I don't know about this. I don't know. Chandrachur did make a comment. I have not followed it. Okay. Okay. This is good. Do you think the shallow research of topics maybe uh, may maybe go back to our primary education yeah. as well? It is more about clearing this exam than better understanding. Absolutely. That that that's the root cause of all this. Absolutely. So basically. ऑनेस्टली मैं क्या बोलूं मैं भी ऐसा ही था एग्जाम के एक हफ्ते पहले पढ़ता था वो जाके वर्बल डायरिया या रिटर्न डायरिया करके आ जाता था और मैं आगे भूल जाता था ऑनेस्टली इफ आई वुड नॉट हैव गॉन टू कनाडा एंड एंड आई एंड आई शेयर दिस स्टोरी एवरी टाइम आई वाज गिवन अ बुक बाय दिस गोरा हु वाज अ क्लासमेट हु टोल्ड मी टू रीड दिस बुक व्हाई डू अदरवाइज स्मार्ट पीपल बिलीव वियर्ड थिंग्स बाय माइकल शर्मा हां Just just changed me, and uskaya there was this course of decision making, uh -huh. and the entire course, you know how they taught us. They were like they showed us that movie on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, and they said first you will form a team of Russia and America. Hmm. First you will do Russia, and they will do America, and then after that you will do America, and they will do Russia. Hmm. I was like, but I guess it's also happening. I guess it's also happening. This is game, gaming, war gaming stuff. Yeah, I never did that before. Yeah, who does that? No one does that. And I was like, damn. ऐसे पढ़ाई होती है ये तो बहुत मस्त है पिक्चर देख रहे और लड़ाई कर रहे एक दूसरे से डिबेट कर रहे एंड दैट चेंज मी एंड एंड आई एंड आई डोंट नो व्हाट हैपेंस इन स्कूल्स टुडे मे बी हमारे टाइम पे तो कुछ नहीं हुआ कुछ नहीं कुछ नहीं या ओके व्यूज ऑन गोडसे एंड ब्राह्मण मैसेकर आई मीन आई हैव शेयर्ड माय व्यू ऑन ब्राह्मण मैसेकर बट एज़ फार एज़ गोडसे इज कंसर्न नॉट अ फैन आई थिंक ही इज अ मर्डरर एंड इन माय व्यू टू यूज योर एनालॉजी गोडसे इज मर्डर एंड क्राइम पुश्ड बैक द हिंदू मूवमेंट 500 इयर्स Uh, how so? Could you explain? I'm not sure. I'm not aware. So he created because he is now used as a straw man, and okay. he straw man uh -huh. on Hindutva. Okay, okay. He is the mascot of Hindutva. Yeah. Donor, okay. So yes. I think his his act actually pushed back Hindutva, which was not what it is explained today. Okay. In my view, I don't know about what your view is. I'm not really that knowledgeable knowledgeable about this, this entire thing. So yeah, my view on Godse is very clear. I don't. don't. Don't uh, don't appreciate that man at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say, "Oh, read his statement in the court." Yeah, what was so special about what Look, he said? Look, like I say, forget what people said or wrote. Look at their action from the consequences. So that's what exactly you're doing over here. Yeah, With, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's his, logical. His actions pushed the the movement back so oh. many years. Okay, that we are you know bearing the brunt of that. Like, just one more action. Savarkar's mercy petition. Hmm? Until and unless I was not shared other mercy petitions written by other <laughs> leaders, I thought Savarkar was the only person who had written mercy petitions. Okay, okay. And I did not know that the Savarkar brothers had reached out to Gandhi ji, mm -hmm. and it was Gandhi ji who had also given the suggestion that by mercy petition, write na. I see. Wow. I don't know until I read Vikram's book. Okay. Vikram explained this, and Vikram showed the evidence. Okay. I was like, "Acha, ये वाला बात है." I did not know that. I did not know this. Hmm. <laughs> See that that's that's what happens when you cherry pick data. Yeah. There's only one side of the story. Okay. From the Indian subcontinent, which Muslims from the past or present are youth icons? Except APJ. ये क्या cheating है यार APJ को क्यों नहीं डाल सकते? I mean, for me, I can give an answer. I will say my biggest inspiration. I mean, it's very funny because Bulleshah is not considered Muslims by Muslims, but I would say the greatest Muslim. For me, I mean, people will say again, Kushal is Punjabi, so he has a Punjabi bias. No, no, I just read Bulle Shah. Uh -huh. I loved Bulle Shah. I think Bulle Shah is one of the great Muslims from the past. Okay. Very interesting character. One of the most famous lines of Bulle Shah is, "O uh, tenu kafir kafir aakh de tu ananu aho aho aakh." As in, arthat, they keep calling you kafir kafir. You keep telling them, "Yes, I am a kafir. Yes, I am a kafir." So was he Muslim, Bulle Shah? I mean, Sufi tha. सूफी था ओके okay, okay. सूफी था ओके okay. इंटरेस्टिंग था अभी सूफी था कि नहीं था किसी को नहीं मालूम उसको तो मानते नहीं थे वे लोग बट या फॉर मी फ्रॉम द पास्ट आई वुड से दैट प्रेजेंट बिकॉज आई हैव अ पॉलिटिकल बायस के के मोहम्मद इफ आई एम नॉट अलाउड टू से एपीजे के के मोहम्मद आर्कियोलॉजिस्ट ओ डेफिनेटली डेफिनेटली या ही इज इज डन ट्रिमेंडस अमाउंट ऑफ वर्क यू नो इन अनकवरिंग द ट्रुथ Oh, definitely. I think it should be given some genuinely large. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Award. Yeah, for me, these uh, 
these two are the ones i could think from the top of my head uh-huh. i'm sure there will be others mm. in fact uh, i would i would tell people to look up the history of tipu sultan's father also very interesting fellow that guy. okay who was that uh, hyder ali hyder ali okay. i'm not saying he was some modicum of decency he had many flaws but mm. but the point is when you look at tipu and then you look at hyder ali you'll be like ah oh, interesting that okay. guy was not that bad <laughs> <laughs> when you control tipu was so bad i see yeah. that Heather Ali was like not that bad. Uh, it, it's very interesting. I, mm. Again, I did not know a lot about Heather Ali until I was told to read some of his stuff. Okay. And then read Tipu. Why Tipu was a barbarian? Mm. I don't know why Tipu is celebrated. <laughs> it's very like go and ask the Christians in his state. Uh huh. They dislike him even more than the Hindus do. Okay. Mm. Which is very interesting because he he really did a number on them. Mm. The Christians. Mm-hmm. The Christians don't celebrate Tipu Day too. Okay. In that state. I see. I see. uh-huh they have as much problems as anybody else do and they're like yaar tum matlab kaun si baatein kar rahe ho it's very interesting mm. so who else is like is uh, okay is the plus 40k demand going to hurt i think they're talking about the reclamation of 40000 temples is do, do you think is going to hurt future temple reclamation or is good for temple reclamation now my views on this uh, are very clear um i am not ki kashi mathura ho gaya so you stop that's not my view but my view is also at the same time that reckless claim should not be made if you have a claim of 40k temples show me where the source is praman do praman do hmm. uh, sitaram goel does not talk about 40k temples okay so basically there are two books that have listed uh, temples okay uh-huh. so i can give you the names of the books um and uh, then people can make their own decisions so basically two books hain one is two volumes hindu temples what happened to them by sitaram goel volume 1 and volume 2 mm-hmm. the other is uh, hideaway communalism okay arun shori ye surani mana hideaway communalism these are the two books that talk about these numbers mm-hmm. uh, and uh, Sitaram Goel ji said around 2000 2000ish the usme se he could not prove more than 1800 okay have some evidence and when he said some evidence could be epigraphic could be text text based mm-hmm. could be x could be y okay now the problem with this evidence and tell me if i'm wrong mm-hmm. is that if we look at only muslim chroniclers mm-hmm. as an evidence yeah the problem is that they are always going to brag yeah that's true i mean the muslim chronicles uh, or the christian chroniclers or the hindu chroniclers if i'm going by their word directly well then the muslim chronicler said uh, prophet muhammad split the moon in half mm. and the christian chronicler said jesus walked on water and the hindu chronicler said we had a pushpak vimana mm. is that citation no that's just well you can't uh, take that as uh, evidence so muslim chronicler said we went there we destroyed thousands of temples and that is treated as an actual evidentiary point like don't we have to see the archaeology don't we have to see anything beyond that and when sitaram goel tried to make a list he could not come up with more than 1800 tangible things where we could find some evidence okay hmm. and even if that we start finding with a tooth comb we may not find any evidence and the dusra thing is that agar hum log 40000 mandir ki baat kar rahe hain to yaar hamare country ka ek landmass to hoga na ha to per square kilometer kitne mandir honge to pura ke desh khod denge hum log so ye pro i this is my answer you don't have to agree with me no my perspective is that look i don't know how many temples were destroyed okay i don't know the number i've not read those books mm. my point is very clear if you say x number of temples were destroyed i'm mm. i'm sure there should be evidence for it mm. and that evidence should be admissible in, in any court of law mm. that's all that's the only kind of proof one would require right so if if the evidence is there then yeah maybe it's a legitimate claim so basically the question was making statements like 40k temples hmm. does it hurt kashi mathura i think it does look is that number based on any facts i don't think so so then then it would hurt it if it does hurt yeah if the number is based on factual evidence then well that's a whole different story because i think people misunderstood my stand on social media my stand was not kashi mathura and done my hmm. stand was no every single claim where hmm. we can show that over a period of 500 years 200 years we've been constantly trying to worship there and we are not allowed to worship there hmm. that's a tangible proof nahi to yaar aise to conquest kiya hai bhai conquest to i mean i don't know how to say it to people but conquest it's a legitimate tool i mean indians have also conquests 
outside India, people don't want to accept that. I mean, you know history far more than I do. Abhi hum Cambodia ka gana gaate gaate to nahi pahunche the na udhar. Yeah. Angkor, I, I think there were trade relations. Trade relations the, magar yeah. conquest to humne bhi kitna kiya. Cholas, we know what the Cholas did. Yeah. That's an un- undeniable truth. Haan. They conquered all the way to the Philippines. It yeah. was conquest, military conquest. Yeah, conquest yeah. tha na. So, yeah. ये बोलना कि हमारी सोसाइटी में कॉन्क्वेस्ट का कॉन्सेप्ट नहीं भाई हम भी ह्यूमन बीइंग्स हैं ह्यूमन बीइंग्स आर अ वायलेंट स्पीशीज हां तो फिर अगर कॉन्क्वेस्ट इज द क्वालिफाइंग क्राइटेरिया इट्स अ वेरी डेंजरस क्राइटेरिया फिर तो यार अफ्रीकंस यहां पे 70000 साल पहले आए थे तो अफ्रीकंस क्या बोल देंगे सारी दुनिया मेरी तो फिर कैसे इंडिया सिर्फ सेंटिनलीज का <laughs> मैं किधर जाऊं ये तो टेक्निकली तो वही है ना <laughs> बाकी तो सारे कोट एंड कोट कॉन्क्वेस्ट है ना ये प्रॉब्लम होती है सो आई मीन टू मी we should not stop at kashi mathura that is not my argument my argument is that we should look at all these numbers all i could find was 20 temples till now jinke actual documents aane shuru ho gaye documents what kind of documents archaeology epigraphic evidence so who is doing this research tablets ye so ye sab survey kon kar rahe hai literally independent people Achha. who look at archaeological records and then present it to people who can fight the case for them. oh i see i see so it's independent uh, individuals who are doing that yeah to yahi hota hai hum thodi na koi believe karte hain aur archaeology bol do to wo bolenge western construct hai beowulf ke jaise kuch log yahan pe bol dete okay to haz raha hai bhai mazak to karte hain mere sunne pehle yeah because you don't read twitter comments i know i i read all these things see my point is that we should not use hyperbole when it comes to serious issues what we should do is we should say that in every single temple this is my view where there is an active attempt to pray which has been stopped for a period of time i think the community has every right to claim that every mm. right to it could be 100000 it could be 1 million and what if there is no active uh, you know attempt to worship there if if that cannot be established what do you do then <laughs> you just let it go right i mean kya karoge yeah mere ko ek baat bata aaj agar hum log hypothetically maine maharashtra mein to remote area mein land le liya theek hai private bungalow society mein land le liya pa idhar devlali mein land le liya devlali mein bungalow plots milte hypothetically aha ab main khod raha hu wahan pe mujhe koi ek murti mil gayi andar ab main kya karu uska wo land kiska hai wo kiska land kya malum अभी मैं हिंदू होऊंगा मैं वो मूर्ति निकालूंगा उसको बराबर से मेंटेन करूंगा मेरे घर के अंदर मंदिर बनाऊंगा और फिर बंगला बनाऊंगा और वो लैंड टू डेटी का नहीं हुआ ना नहीं हुआ नहीं मैं ये कह रहा हूं मगर ये बोलने से लोगों को हर्ट नहीं होना चाहिए इसका मतलब नहीं है कि मैं एंटी टेंपल रिक्लेमेशन मैं बोल रहा हूं कि यार किधर तो हमको लाइन ड्रा करनी पड़ेगी ना यस लुक देयर हैज टू बी प्रूफ एविडेंस वो मैं कह रहा हूं या मैं मैं नहीं कह रहा हूं कि अह अह कि टेंपल्स रिक्लेम मत करो मैं मैं अनलाइक अदर्स मैं बता पुराना बीजेपी वोटर हूं मैं और मैंने कभी छुपाया भी नहीं है मैं ओरिजिनल संगी हूं मैं ट्विटर संगी नहीं हूं मैंने कभी मैं मैं रियल लाइफ संगी हूं मैंने और कुछ किया ही नहीं है मेरी लाइफ में मेरा ब्रेन और कुछ फंक्शन नहीं करता मेरा ब्रेन लिटरली उसके जैसे ही सोचता है तो मतलब ये जो आजकल के ओंगे पोंगे आके यार हम जैसे लोगों को यार प्रवचन देते तो हमको लगता है भाई हम तो इधर ही मरवा रहे थे तुम अभी आए हो हम तो पहले से ही इधर थे तुम नई घोड़ा गाड़ी पे चढ़ रहे हो हम तो हमेशा से इधर थे और मैंने कभी नहीं बोला कि काशी मथुरा पे एंड करो मगर मुझे ये भी सही नहीं लगता है कि भाई यार मतलब चालीस की एविडेंस तो दो अभी इफ समी गिवस दिस इज जस्ट अ नेगोशिएशन टैक्टिक टू कम ऑन द टेबल दैट इज अ गुड आर्ग्यूमेंट दैट आई अंडरस्टैंड कि हम हाइपरबली यूज कर रहे हैं क्योंकि भाई ऑल इंडिया मुस्लिम पर्सनल लॉ बोर्ड भी तो बेशरम एक नंबर का है ना वो बोलता है ही नहीं अरे क्या नहीं है अगर तुम्हारा मुंह पे एविडेंस है ज्ञान वापी की तुम बोलते हो अभी ऑल इंडिया मुस्लिम पर्सनल लॉ बोर्ड इतना बेशरम है यू नो व्हाट स्टेटमेंट दे मेक वी डिनाई द आर्कियोलॉजिकल सर्वे रिपोर्ट बाय एएसआई ओके ओ यार मतलब हद होती है अच्छा मैं तेरे को एक और बढ़िया सी चीज दिखाता हूँ दो स्क्रीनशॉट है मेरे को मैंने दोस्त ने मेरे को व्हाट्सएप पे भेजा नाम नहीं बताऊंगा दोस्त का क्योंकि तू भी जानता होगा मैं भी जानता हूँ ठीक है तो बड़े मैं बड़ा हंसा था जब मैंने पहन के कि अगर वो बिल्डिंग ज्ञान हमने नहीं बनाई ना तो भाई उसने टूट जाना है और उसका एविडेंस कहाँ है <laughs> उसका एविडेंस लिटरली लिटरली मैं मजाक नहीं कर रहा हूँ उसका एविडेंस है आर्कियोलॉजिकल सर्वे की रिपोर्ट सो so, ये रिपोर्ट को डाउनलोड करते हैं 
और दिखाते हैं लोगों को कि क्या तमाशे चालू है हमारे देश में एंड इट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग की बेसिकली एज पर द ए एस आई फ्रिकेंट डिलेपिटेटेड स्ट्रक्चर अच्छा ए एस आई कह रहा है कि कुछ किया नहीं ना तो भाई गिर जाना है इसने अच्छा इसने गिर जाना है एंड यू नो फॉर द बेनिफिट ऑफ पीपल भाई आप भी देख लो आप लोग भी समझ लो मैं ताकि आपको सॉरी एंड अब मैं यार इसको ऊपर नीचे कैसे करते हैं ओके अभी इसको इधर से इसको ऊपर कैसे करते हैं नीचे कैसे करते हैं डू यू नो हाउ टू डू इट ये बंद है ओके वेट आई विल ट्राई रिड्यूस द साइज ठीक है दैट वर्क्स अबे यार आई एम सॉरी आई एम अ बिट ऑफ अ नूब व्हेन इट कम्स टू दीस थिंग्स बट आई वांट पीपल टू लुक एट दिस इमेज वेयर अगर अगर लोग इस हालत में है तो ये कैसे चलेगा हाउ द हेल कैन ये स्ट्रक्चर की हालत देखो ये तो स्ट्रक्चर की हालत है ये स्ट्रक्चर का क्लेम है ये लोग कह रहे हैं कि द स्ट्रक्चर इज इन दिस स्टेट सो वॉट आर दे सींग फ्रॉम द एंट्रेंस टू द सेलर द लेफ्ट फोर ब्रैकेट आर क्रैक विच इज डेंजरस it may not bear any additional load <laughs> vibration approx basically what the asi report is saying is that this damn thing actually bahut unsound ho gaya hai unsound ho gaya hai okay. so like it or not isko todna padega okay isko todna padega aha to kuch bhi kar lo ye masjid jane wali hai okay usko agar hum take over kar le hum usko as is where is condition mein mandir ke jaise bhi use nahi kar sakte hmm that's what the asi report is saying it is literally detailed the entire thing okay this is I, the latest report yeah yeah okay. this is the survey that has come just now that was submitted in the court okay okay just mm-hmm. now and mm-hmm. and that's what so i don't know what people are saying but yeah look most people i would imagine don't even know what's going on they're just you know reacting based on god knows what yeah okay so can the terror attacks be linked to mughal thought process or their recent phenomenon Huh? Look, I, don't I don't know what the Mughal thought process was. <laughs> I don't know. मतलब I I really don't know. I mean, terror attacks based on what? Like I can't give a definitive answer for this. Why was SCB legacy not given credit in our history? What is SCB now? Subhash Chandra Bose. Oh, okay, okay, SCB. Well, he was kind of an inconvenient. Uh, chapter for the people who were ruling india after 47 so you know as a kid i used to see his you know his his portrait mm. in schools and stuff so it's not like he was totally forgotten or whatever but mm. yeah i'm sure he was not given the due due credit mm. so that was there um thoughts on the upcoming pakistan election any impact on us what's your kya fark padta hai yaar who comes yeah, to honestly power? that's i mean See, i don't nobody even... comes to power there it's just a seat to get yeah. chair okay <laughs> same question what do you think about the pakistan election happening on 8th february makes no difference my friends makes uh, no difference mm, okay uh for abhijit sir how do you believe psychologists like myself could effectively contribute to science podcast to broaden the scope of discussion and engage audiences from diverse backgrounds well you are from a scientific profession so how can you contribute to science podcasts well if you are able to communicate in a easy to understand manner and and provide some insights and some value to the audience in an engaging manner then you would be able to contribute to it to to a podcast i mean podcast is all about you know keeping things simple typically that's how it is of mm. course you can you can nerd it out if you want but you may not get much on audience if you do that mm. so yeah you know provide some value and and uh, help people in some way mm. somebody says isn't 100 reclamations also going to stir things up no it, the point is not 100 or 40000 the point is how do you go about it and how do you lay there has to be a due process proper process yeah, yeah. the you just can't pull numbers out of your backside yeah. and just say things no number needs to have a foundation in in yeah. reality yeah, and you have to you have to also look at the overall effect on the society just to say it has no effect on society is just lying to yourself hmm. you have to take i i think if you just say 40000 it obviously does have a psychological impact on people so i think it is not uh, that easy 
why is ccs delaying amca funds when our adversaries are inducting fifth generation aircrafts your question. i have no idea I no know. idea. I have zero opinion about this. Uh, the AMC is the advanced medium combat aircraft, but I don't know what what's going on with it. I'm not I'm not mm-hmm. aware. Yeah, so somebody has said Jaipur Dialogues is making a temple database portal. Boss, I mean, the temple database portal already exists. Sitaram Goel's views are tabulated very well. Like uh, beyond that, it is not just saying that these temples were broken. It is where were they broken? Are there any evidences? Hmm. Uh, are they only textual? Only textual may not stand scrutiny in the court of law. You need archaeological evidence. You need archaeological evidence, epigraphic evidence yeah, yeah. on all those things. Mm. These are not that easy. I'm not saying you will not find it. I'm saying best of luck. Mm. That That's all I can say because it's easy to go one way or the other, but you have to be very practical. Do you even have the the number of personnel that's needed for this. Nahi hai, yaar. Nahi hai, ASI mein you ASI baat karna hai, yaar. Abhi, <laughs> you and I, because of the sheer privilege of being podcasters mm. and being connected to so many people, I mean, I don't want to take names. You have spoken to the same people. I have. Yeah. You know what is the hal inside. I know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we know what's going on inside. I mean, we don't have resources. We don't have to ask them. And, man, we're talking about here, we'll claim 50,000 or 1,000,000 temples. Oh, brother, you have money for 10 temples. Not to do it. The amount of uh, archaeological research that is involved in just freaking getting one temple dug up and done. I mean, I don't know. I think people don't know. Like, you know, I was shocked that Dr. Manjul even had to say things like, carbon dating because carbon dating basically and in my head I was like <laughs> no, but lots of people believe that rock stone whatever you should carbon date it and establish the date oh, yeah. they don't know that carbon dating can only be done on organic when I had written on Twitter that carbon dating I did not mean the actual stone yeah. I had said that there will be some things that will fall down and fall down and fall down and fall carbon date karo, hmm. and then stone ko dusre ko se hum log, uh, find out how old it is but here we say that the stone ko hi carbon date kar do. <laughs> to yaar, iska kya karo ge? Kuch nahi kar do so, I yeah. mean you can try and educate them ke, what, what is the fundamental basis of carbon dating it's about carbon 14 which is a isotope that decays at a certain rate. So the amount of isotope you have in a certain organic uh, remains or whatever, huh. wood or whatever, it can tell you it, uh, to a reasonable degree of accuracy how old it is. Yeah. So that's the fund- fundamental foundation, very simply put, of carbon dating. Hmm. In rocks, you don't have carbon-14. You don't have any carbon because yeah. it's not a biological thing. So how do you d- date that? You can't. But I'm glad Dr. Manjul came on the ANI podcast and you know explained it uh, many things. And- okay. Very interesting. Even Dr. Manjul did not talk about out of India. He stayed away from it. Huh? Okay. Mm. He just said South Russia doesn't make sense. Mm. Okay. That's all he kept on. All right. He never went into the out of India theory. Mm. Uh, very, very interesting. I don't know if you've heard it. No, I haven't seen it. Jarur, jar, jarur sunna. All right. Um, what about Maheshwar Mahadev Temple as a pagan? I feel very humiliated about uh, the destroyed statues of Devi's there. Now, one, once again, like I said, uh, who destroyed the temple? Who destroyed the statues? What are the reasons? I mean, wh- how do you feel when you go to Hampi or any other great monument of our past and where people have written, Raju loves Ragini? How yeah. do you feel about that then? It's, it's, uh, I can't express myself in words when I see such things. It's extremely disappointing to see people not even honoring and respecting their own heritage. It's, it's sad. It's very clear, right? Yeah. I mean, this is not the first time. I'm not making these things no, up. No, you, it's there all. It's everywhere. Like you go to Indus Valley sites and Raju loves Lagini is all over the place. Yeah. yeah. That's how stupid people are in yeah, this country. Yeah, they yeah. don't value their own heritage and then yeah. they talk big and wax eloquent about all these things and then somebody... I, I don't know. Anyways, before um, we wrap things up, is there anything else you want to say? No, I'm good. Just came for a chat. Yeah, it's yeah. good, man. I, I'm I'm glad you came. We might try to do things more regularly yeah, now sure. that whenever yeah. you and I are here, this way, uh, you know, both our uh, answer, you know, audiences can mm. um, cross pollinate. Yes, cross pollinate. <laughs> and look, it's good, right? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Mm. I I even if people disagree, mm. the one thing people need to realize is it's at least have a good discussion, right? Yeah, absolutely. 
you can just sing. I mean, no, no two people can uh, agree on everything. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, you won't meet a single person anywhere in the world with mm. whom you agree with about everything. Yeah. So what's the problem? I don't understand why people have to, I don't know, be hostile or whatever or disagreements. Yeah, I don't know why it is. But anyways, thank you very much, Abhiji. No, my pleasure. Coming. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure talking to you. So guys, uh, before we wrap it up, I want to remind everyone in the description, you have Abhijit's Spotify link, uh, YouTube channel link. If you have not subscribed, go subscribe to his channel. Um, he creates great content. Go go check him out. And if you want to support me, you guys know the drill. Uh, like, subscribe, all of that. If you're an audio listener, leave a review. If you can, join the membership program of the Charvak Podcast. You can become a member on YouTube, Patreon, Fanmo, wherever. Buy the merchandise. Do whatever you want to do. But... Uh, also, leave your comment in the comment section. I will see you guys next time. Until then, no stay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.